Hello, coming to you from St. Martin de Porres. I'm sending this podcast to you today, which is a Tuesday, as opposed to the normal Monday, because I was clearing out my room in D.C., being that all my studies are complete. So this week, the podcast series will be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, instead of our normal Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So I just uh, ask for your forgiveness for that. But in the meantime, we're going to dive into our new series, which will be on the Liturgy of the Hours. If you recall, our first series was on the resurrection of Jesus and how this is inseparable from the existence of us as God's people, the church, the very body of Christ, and how this gives way to our sacramental life, how this enables our life in Jesus and with the visible signs of grace, whether it be his proclaimed word or the sacraments, to enter into our lives. This is all rooted in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Um, So that was the first series. The second series was on the Eucharist, how we encounter him in the opening of the scriptures and the breaking of the bread and unpacking um, the rites by which we do so in the Roman church or more appropriately in our church, the Church of New York, which is in communion with the Church of Rome. Now, from there, I want to go on to the Liturgy of the Hours. It's a topic that's not very well known, so this might be um, a little new, as opposed to the way we dived into the rites of the Mass, even though I'm sure that certain aspects or certain um, portions of those meditations I offered were new to you. But I think this topic will be more or less new to most of those listening. You see, the Eucharistic liturgy is the highest of all liturgies. It is the source and the summit of the Christian life. It makes us who we are, the very body of Christ. But once we've been made into who we are and once... We become all the more who we are each time we partake of the Eucharist. There are other aspects of our life, especially our day-to-day life, that has to be animated by that very spirit that we receive in the Eucharist. Because you see, we receive the communion, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit every single time we receive the Eucharist. And it's this fellowship, this unconditional love of the Spirit that empowers us to go forth and to make disciples. And the first disciple we make is our very self. And we do so by exercising the priesthood of Christ in us, our prophetic identity and our royal identity. You'll see all these things collide here in the Liturgy of the Hours. You are truly in Christ by baptism and confirmation, an adopted son of the Father and a bearer of God's Spirit, a temple of God's Spirit. You are the very likeness of Christ in this world, so that when one looks upon you, they see the face of God's anointed one. And so if this is your dignity, if you are truly a sharer in Christ's priesthood, one who can offer sacrifice to God, if you are truly a sharer in his prophetic mission, and so you are to witness the, to the truth that you have received, if you are to witness to the very king who has sent you, God himself, and if you are given a royal dignity by which you reign with God over creation, first over yourself, but then in the way that you assist others to accept the kingdom of God. Well, then this requires a day-to-day sanctification of your life, of our lives. And we do so as a church by the liturgy of the hours. And that is why 
Immediately after discussing the Eucharistic liturgy, I want to discuss the liturgy of the hours because the liturgy of the hours is second to the mass. Now, let me explain what I mean by the liturgy of the hours. The liturgy of the hours is a cycle of liturgies that, is off, that are offered during the day, mainly by the ordained and the religious, but also by any faithful who wish to partake of them. But there are a set of liturgies offered throughout the day to complete the cycle of our dedication to God, our own consecration to God. If the Eucharist, once again, is the summit of our life, it's the summit because things lead up to it and things flow from it. To have a crescendo is uh, meaningless, shall we say, if the crescendo pops out of nowhere. No, there's obviously a buildup and then things recede from that. Well, to say that the Eucharist is the pinnacle, the apex of our life, the very breath we breathe, the very moment we receive the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, implies that there are other moments, especially during the day, that lead up to it and flow from it. And that is the liturgy of the hours, these liturgies that are offered by the church throughout the day. So, the Eucharistic liturgy, yes, it's the highest liturgy in the church. It's the liturgy in which you and I become the very body of Christ. But having become the body of Christ, there are other liturgies that can be offered and that are offered in the church for the sanctification of the world. And what are these liturgies? Well, you might come across a book such as this. It's called, well, it's called the Liturgy of the Hours, but... A book akin to this is, uh, contains a series of prayers that are proper to the various seasons of the church year, like Lent, um, Easter, Advent, Christmas, Ordinary Time. It contains psalms, it contains scripture readings, readings from the fathers of the church and famous medieval saints and contemporary saints. It contains prayers appropriate to uh, commemorations of the saints. The Liturgy of the Hours is a way in which we meditate on God's word and offer ourselves as a sacrifice of praise throughout the day. Now, it might not be mandatory in the sense of a moral obligation for the faithful to pray the Liturgy of the Hours, but you might be aware that Jesus said in the Gospels that we should pray without ceasing. He said, pray without ceasing and do not lose heart. And St. Paul used, that, used a similar phrase when he also called the Christians in the early communities he was writing to, to pray without ceasing. So does praying without ceasing mean that you have to offer a set of formal prayers throughout the day? No. But what it does mean is that there should be a spirit of prayer throughout the day. That anointing that you have should be visible in every moment of our existence. The life you live, the life I live, is no longer yourself or myself, but rather it's Christ living in us. And so we first and foremost reflect this in prayer. Now, granted, the way in which we treat one another, the way in which we care for the least of these, is itself a prayer. But the prayer of meditating on God's word and consciously offering oneself as a sacrifice of praise to the Father is how we extend the sanctification of the Spirit throughout the day. How we pray without ceasing. To pray without ceasing is to essentially live out the petition, thy kingdom come throughout the day. How is the kingdom coming? coming? 
God is reigning in you. As God reigned in Christ, he is reigning in you. And that's what happens whenever we meditate on God's word and offer ourselves during the day. Granted, it can take any form, right? But no one is an island, not just as a human being, but especially the way we exist in the church. We are all members, so one member cannot say to the other, I do not need you. Each member is essential. So for us to want to pray without ceasing means that we will offer liturgy as a church without ceasing. And so the liturgy, the hours, is essential to our life as a Christian, even though it's not imposed as a moral obligation upon the faithful. Rather, the clergy and the religious take upon it as an obligation to pray throughout the day. We pray all these other liturgies throughout the day in addition to the Eucharist. But the Second Vatican Council encouraged that the faithful in the parishes know how to pray the liturgy the hours and celebrate it. It's the responsibility of those in holy orders to do so, to train the faithful, how to offer these other liturgies. Because unlike the Eucharistic liturgy, these other liturgies under the umbrella of the liturgy of the hours can be offered without requiring the presiding ministry of a priest. If a priest, well rather, if a bishop, a priest or a deacon is present, they will preside over it and offer a blessing at the end. But if it's just a group of lay faithful, uh, they can also offer these liturgies even in the absence of, of an ordained person. So this is a way in which you can bring this into your very house. You can offer a liturgy in your own house with your family. It's not meant to be a replacement of the Eucharistic liturgy. Rather, like I said, it's leading up to and flowing from that. So second to the Mass, second to the Eucharistic liturgy, are the liturgies of morning and evening prayer. They are the hinges. The liturgies of morning and evening prayer are as follows. They are a collection of psalms, a reading from scripture, a response. Um, there is a canticle from the gospel. There are intercessions offered for the whole world, and then there's an Our Father closing prayer and a benediction. That's morning and evening prayer in the, its most generic picture. Notice how that's almost all the elements of the Mass except the Eucharistic prayer and reception of communion. There's a reason for that. The Mass is the fullest liturgy because it has the Eucharistic prayer and communion. The reason why morning and evening prayer are the highest liturgies after the Eucharistic liturgy is because they have all those other they have all the elements of sanctification that the Mass has save the Eucharistic prayer and communion. They have scripture, they have the Psalms, they have a portion of the gospel, intercessions, the Our Father, a closing prayer, and a benediction. All the elements of the Mass are essentially present except the Eucharistic prayer and the reception of communion. There's even a form of an offertory shall we say, in morning and evening prayer. Why? Because the whole entire theme of morning and evening prayer is that you, the body of Christ, the members of the body of Christ, are offering yourselves as a living sacrifice to God in Christ. So that in a certain sense, there is a offertory, even within morning and evening prayer, except it doesn't take the presentation the form of presenting bread and wine but rather presenting your very self as a sacrifice 
And although there isn't a Eucharistic prayer in which you're offering bread and wine as a sacrifice, like I said, you are offering yourself as a victim to God in Christ. And you're doing it consciously during morning and evening prayer. So there is also a sacrifice, a sacrifice of the body of Christ in, in its head before the Father. So do you understand these beginning principles of morning and evening prayer? And as such, the liturgy of the hours. I'll just enumerate them, some of the key things again. Yes, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our life. It's the apex of our existence as Christians. But our priestly identity, our prophetic and kingly identity, means that we extend this by praying without ceasing. And whenever you do so, you're sanctifying the whole day. You're giving a priestly blessing Throughout the whole day. You are reigning. God is reigning in you throughout the whole day. You are witnessing to Christ as a prophet throughout the whole day. And this is even in your daily prayer. But because as members of the body of Christ. We are all interconnected. It's not enough that we just offer prayer. We should offer liturgy as a church. And not just the Eucharistic liturgy. But all those liturgies that build up to and flow from it. And that is the liturgy of the hours. The liturgies offered during the hours of the day. So you see, the first principle is the relationship between the Eucharist and our daily lives. The liturgy of the hours bridges that gap. It brings the blessings of that into our own daily lives by praying the Psalms, the scriptures, the gospels, etc. throughout the day. It sanctifies the day for us. And then the other thing is that the liturgies of morning and evening prayer do this in a powerful way, second to the Eucharist itself, because as all the elements of the Mass accept the Eucharistic prayer and communion, and yet, even though Christ is not offered as a sacrifice under the appearances of bread and wine during morning and evening prayer, a true sacrifice is nonetheless offered to God. Why? Because whenever we come to celebrate the liturgy, especially morning and evening prayer, we are offering ourselves in Christ as a sacrifice to God. And you, when you offer yourselves, yourself, you are not a cheap sacrifice, right? You are not something less than Christ. And that's a bold statement. I'll say that again. You are not something less than Christ. And why can I say that with boldness? Because as he is, so are you in this world. He abides in you, you abide in him. And by that mystical union, everything of his is yours. And everything of yours is his. So if you offer yourself as a sacrifice in him, he offers himself to the Father on your behalf. He offers you in himself before the Father. And he asks the Father to look upon you as he looks upon Christ himself. So for you to offer a sacrifice to God in Christ, for you to offer yourself as a member of Christ's body, is for Christ to offer him his very self before the Father, because you are so inseparably linked with Christ, and separately bound to him. So just notice that, that whenever... We come to offer these other liturgies. We are truly offering Christ's sacrifice, but not under the appearances of bread and wine, but rather in our offering of the Psalms as incense, like incense before God, and meditating upon God's word 
and singing the gospel canticle and offering intercessions, we are joining Christ in his sacrifice of praise. So truly, I tell you, the sacrifice of Christ is manifested in the liturgy of the hours and the other liturgies we offer. The sacrifice of Christ and his priesthood is truly manifested in you. It takes a different form, as you can see, to offer it in the form of psalms and meditating on God's words and God's word and so on is distinct, clearly distinct from offering that sacrifice under the forms of bread and wine. And obviously, we're not constituted, we're not fashioned into his body when we pray the liturgy of the hours, right? Rather, we're fashioned into his body when we offer the Eucharist, and then when we offer the liturgy of the hours throughout the day, we're allowing that communion of the Holy Spirit we have received in the Eucharist to be unpacked in us, to strengthen us, and continually nourish us throughout the day. So, I offer this preliminary meditation, and I hope that uh, tomorrow and then next Monday and Wednesday, we can dive into the liturgy, hour, liturgy of the hours more. But I hope you see the preliminary groundwork here and how it's very meaningful to your own life, that there are other liturgies that we offer throughout the day. The two, one, the two uh, hinge ones, the most principal ones, are morning and evening prayer, second to the Mass, because they have almost all the elements of the Mass. And because in them, Christ's sacrifice is made present, but in a clearly distinct way. And you are sharing in that sacrifice and offering it, but once again, in a distinct way from the Mass. But the grace of God's anointing is still breaking through. And this is something that could even be offered into your, in your very house. You can sanctify your house by it. So as we meditate upon this more tomorrow, I will unpack the elements of morning and evening prayer and all that is entailed in it. So I hope you've enjoyed this and many blessings today.